Hey everyone, this is James Bedell of the Letting Guy Podcast. Welcome back. This is episode two of uh, of our little adventure here with AV Nation. I'm here with Christian Methus of Design One Lighting Design. Hey Christian, how are you? Hey James, very well, thanks. So we decided after uh, our, we did a very brief little uh, sort of introduction to what this podcast was going to be, and then George and I talked about it a little bit, and we decided the best thing to do is start off with a sort of lighting design 101 conversation. So what is, you know, when we talk about lighting and lighting design, those are two slightly different things, and so we want to talk about what lighting design is, why it's important, how you collaborate with lighting designers, and sort of uh, from a, a real high level and then move our way downward into sort of specific concepts and ideas. And Christian in Design One is a, a great place to start because, uh, you know, if you take a look at, at d1ny.com, uh, the, the portfolio website, you can see there's a wide variety of projects out there. We, we wanted to talk to someone who had a sort of breadth of experience. And so Christian was a, a kind enough to join us this afternoon. So how are you, man? I'm great. Thanks, James. Good, good. So let's let's talk about just sort of um, from a really really high level. When you think of what a lighting designer brings to a to the conversation in terms of collaboration, what are some of the things that, that you think of in that in that regard? I think uh, a lot of what a uh, lighting designer brings to the table is an understanding of what light uh, can do in given situations, given environments, uh, and and able to. Uh, Sort of help strengthen uh, a project uh, in subtle ways that uh, that otherwise might uh, might not have been realized. Okay, and I think that's a that's a good place to start. You know, the I know a lot of people. I mean, I've you know, my background started in theatrical lighting, and um, you know, I, I know a lot of people that can take a dimmer rack and ten source fours, and they can light something. Right? They can put light sure. on a stage. Um, that's a lot different from designing lighting in, ter in the context of a project. And so what are some of the, the sort of cues that, that you as a designer take that takes it from illuminating the space, just getting sure, light in sure. the room, to a design scheme? What are some of the, the thought processes that go into that? Well, I think there's a couple things that play in. I think first and foremost is the venue. Mm -hmm. um, whether or not you want to acknowledge the venue uh, or do you want to completely negate it. Mm -hmm. um, light has the ability to, to be very transformative. Uh, so, you know, these, these are uh, very much on the, the physical elements of a job. The, the venue it can play a very, very strong role. But then within the sort of programmatic aspect of what's going on um, is, you know, is it a dance party? Is it a cocktail hour? Is it a, uh, you know, dramatic stage production? Um, these elements also play very heavily into what the actual design should be, and and to my point earlier, you know, lighting is always in uh, support of something else going on, whether it be architecture or theater uh, or music. Right, right. One of the things I used to tell theatrical collaborator, collaborators was that we always go last. You know, we have to have a set before we can light it. Um, right. So. With that in mind, and let's let's take a, a couple of different kind of project types just to sort of give give some concreteness to the conversation. Let's say you were doing a pop-up store for argument's sake, something that's a I love pop-ups because they're sort of semi-architectural, they're sort of special event, there's usually programmatic elements to it. When you walk into the room, you sort of sit with you, you know, your environmental designers, the producers, whoever, you know, PR people, whoever are involved with it. What are some of the questions that you're going to ask off the top of the, you know, sort of off the top? Once you've seen sketches and you sort of have a rough idea, what what are some of the things that you're going to bring to the table in that conversation? Well, I think that's a great example actually, because you're right. It's a it's a retail store that only stays up for a couple weeks usually, maybe even a couple days. Right. Um, so it has a very different take than uh, what you would probably be doing lighting wise for a permanent uh, retail store. Um, it, you're really allowed a little bit more license. Um, as far as being a little bit more theatrical, um, usually there's live events uh, as part of the pop-up experience. People, uh, you know, I just did a Yo Play uh, pop-up store, and you know, sure, there's a so there's a couple areas where they're tasting, and there's a couple areas where they're showing what the new flavors would be. So it's very, uh, it's a very live experience as opposed to the the more passive experience of a retail store. So uh, to your point. Um, you know, I think in speaking with the environmental uh, designer and the producer, you know, one of the questions was, you know, 
are we making this feel uh, like a bright retail store, or is this you know more of a a club loungy um, sort of after hours feel? Um, you know these, and then from there we're sort of given a you know some direction as to as to which way to take it. And and so this is where I think I want to focus the conversation a little bit. In the difference, you know, you can call a lot of lighting production companies, for instance, if you're working on a pop-up store, and say I've got a twenty-five thousand square foot space, I need it illuminated for two weeks, and very competently. One of those those production teams will come in and they'll set up some trusses and they'll get you some you know some floods on LED floods or whatever on that truss. They'll get the space lit and it will at least be functional. The difference between what uh, a production company might do out of the box and what a lighting designer does is they try to help. What I the phrase I like to use is tell the story. Sure. So whether that's yeah you know, that story might be the experience of a pop up store. It might be a wedding. I don't know. It could be mm -hmm. anything. Mm -hmm. but, it's it's helping to tell that story. So, what are some of the design tools? You know, things like uh, just a prompt, things like contrast, or what are some of the tools that you're going to bring to the to to the table that might um, might surprise people or might be a little different than just getting the space illuminated? I think you know one of the things that we learned very early in. I also come from a theatrical background. Um, you know, one of the things that that we were taught very early in theatrical lighting design is this idea of selective visibility, right? Certain things in the space are important, certain things are not. Um, and I think uh, even that subtle difference uh, from just bringing in LED floodlights and, and, and cre you know, creating a bright, evenly illuminated space as opposed to really dialing in, uh, you know, logos on the wall a little brighter than the floor and the um, Tasting area is a little brighter than, you know, also a little brighter than the floor, and really creating some highlight and low light, and creating some drama, and creating this this selective visibility, um, is an extremely uh, effective, uh, rather subtle, uh, but effective way of of delivering something a little bit, a little bit beyond just uh, your basic illumination. Yeah, I think it's, um, and in a very sort of, uh, <laughs> I don't know how to. A lightweight way of, of describing that is it's sort of putting an Instagram filter on a typical picture, right? Sure. Like you sure. can, you've got it, you can see the photo and it works fine, but why do we filter these things? Why do we make them look different? Because maybe we want to up contrast or highlight a certain piece of the image. Right. That's what, what lighting design is all about. Um, who are some of, when, at the highest level, who are you working with on, let's say, I mean, I'm looking at your project list, on, on something like a, uh, who are the stakeholders in a pop-up store versus an architectural project? Who are the people that are you're going to take your cues from? I think uh, a pop-up store has uh, a little bit more of the live event, uh, sort of corporate event structure. Um, there's the executive producer who, at the end of the day, is sort of the the last, you know, the last say. He's he's driving all of the creative uh, back to the client. Um, he's subcontracted myself as the lighting designer. He's subcontracted. Uh, a production designer for the physical aspect, you know, for the physical design of the store, uh, and all of that he's carrying back to the client. Um, they are carrying back to the client, and you know, and delivering as a unified vision. Um, so somewhere within the the production designer and the executive producer on something like a pop up store are are definitely my go tos. Um, those are the people that I'm going to ask those those tougher questions, those more esoteric questions about look and feel and color and tone and texture and movement um, and then in an architectural project you know really my my go-to if I have access to the owner uh, the owner is at the end of the day who I you know who I'm answering to but more often than not uh, I'm answering directly to the architect who like the executive producer is going back to the owner with a with a unified uh, idea sure sure so um, more and more projects have got bigger and bigger design teams. There are more and more specialists on a job nowadays. Sure. You know, there's it, by necessity, and, and a large part of our audience are going to be the AV integrators. They're going to be the AV designers. There's video design on projection design is becoming more and more part of the part of the deal. Um, do you see personally lighting design as separate and apart from projection design, or do you see it as as one discipline? Really depends on the project. Um, 
I think there. I'm finding that the the skill set technically is definitely separated, but that as a designer, um, I need to have the whole right. I need to have the the whole picture in mind. Um, I'm actually just doing a project now where I'm suggesting uh, using some RGB lasers. Uh, but I want. I was very clear with the producer. I said, "Look, I don't want a laser guy, right? I don't want someone to come in and do their own thing with lasers. What I want are lasers as lights that I will then creatively be responsible for." Now, to yeah. that end, I have no idea how to go about programming lasers, right? So there would be another programmer, like I have uh, a lighting programmer. I would then also have a laser programmer. Um, I think we're seeing that in the in the permanent uh, market as well, right? Um, the amount of different kinds of lights that go into a, 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 a corporate project or a, or a residential project, and I actually find that the residential projects are, uh, from an installation standpoint, even more intricate. Uh, there tends to be lots of different kinds of loads that need to be controlled, and I am incredibly happy. Uh, that there are, you know, the AV integrators doing that. Back to your projection thing, I think there are there are opportunities to do it together, and then there are opportunities to to simply be collaborating, right? I think, and I think that's the key mostly is to make sure that you're collaborating and really really coming to uh, uh, just telling the one story, right? Like you were talking about. Yeah, I mean, I've been asked a few times, and I got asked this a lot a couple of years ago. People said to me, are, are you going to get into projection mapping? Are you going to become a projection mapping guy? Because, I, I mean, I've done some pop-up work. I've done some special event work that, you know, that's that's a lot of what I did, especially a couple of years ago. And I said, no. <laughs> no, I'm not. That's not what I do. I'm, right. you know, I like projection mapping. I think it's really cool, but I think it's a separate discipline, a separate part yeah. that needs to be treated separately. Um, it can get tricky when you're, if it's a major component of a presentation, for instance, and it's not something I do, but I'm, it's light, and so I have to collaborate with that person to right. make sure we get in the right effect. But it's always um, a balancing act to figure out sort of who who dominates what in that in those those sort of those these new integrations that we're seeing. Um, I think one of the things that is interesting about this trend in pop-up stores is that what we're seeing is in permanent retail more and more mediation. You know, high-end retail is seeing we're seeing more video. We're seeing like if you you know any of these stores on Fifth Avenue, you see integrated video, integrated projection. Um, do you see uh, from a lighting perspective some of these you know, the trends in RGB LED, the trends in projection work, the trends in embedded video? Do you see these as um, as, as trends, or do you see these as things that are here to stay and are, are just going to continue to evolve? I think they're here to stay. I think I think as as the video technology, like like the lighting technology, as it becomes uh, more controllable and less expensive, um, we're going to see more and more of it. Um, and in and and in that, the ability now that it's accessible on a on a grander level, I think we're going to see people taking uh, more creative advantage of it, being less hindered by it, and really bringing to bear uh, some great creative process. Now, that being said, there's a lot of video screens in a lot of stores that have the most boring content you've ever seen, right. and nobody's in charge of them, right? right. And, and it, becomes, it becomes this gray area of, well, the AV designer you know, designed that the screen go there, but he wasn't asked what goes on it. Right. Right. Oh no, right. that's for the store to figure out, or that's for the brand to figure out, and then the brand delivers some boring, you know, yeah, some sure. boring B-roll that that never gets updated, um, which I don't think was the intention. Right. Uh, contrary to that, would be like the you know the gigantic uh, American Eagle uh, video screens in Times Square, which are quite fantastic, right, and and very very effective and and, and always updated. Right. Right. I mean. So I have a little bit of experience with this. I, I used to work for Abercrombie and Fitch, oh, okay, and sure. so I designed, uh, or I was on the design team, I should say, for um, for the Hollister store in Soho and several other locations. And the, one of the gimmicks in Hollister is that there's a window that looks out onto the beach, and what that window is is a live feed of uh, Redondo Beach, California. Mm. And so when they did this to the Soho store, it was a four-story building, and so there was video screens on both sides, and you know. 
it became a lighting nightmare, not because the programming, you know, we, we knew what, what all that was going to be, but there were a lot of design questions. Things like, well, what color should this, the lighting on the stairs be if we're, integra- if we're sort of matching the ocean but not matching the ocean? And what should the light levels be when you have you know, four stories of flat screens blasting light all day? How much supplemental light do you really need? All of these, these sort of questions came up. So it only drives home to me the point that you need a separate discipline. You need a lighting designer that's going to say, that's going to sort of be in the corner of lighting, you know, and say this is what is required to make the light of the space correct. Yeah. Um, it's not that AV isn't good. AV is amazing. It's just that we, we still need a separate discipline to designing a light in the space. Yeah. I think that's important to, to keep, keep people aware of. I think an easy, a very, very uh, straightforward example would be uh, the NBC up front that I just did it was a 125 foot wide LED screen, 19 feet high, right? A sure. huge, huge uh, LED screen that was behind uh, the presenters as they came out on on stage. Gorgeous, but more, you know, throughout the rehearsal process, I continued to ask the the producer uh, to relay to the video team if we could continue to turn the screen down. Right, and it wasn't that I came in undergunned. I had tons of light. Um, it was just from a contrast standpoint, from a you know, from a pure uh, looking at the screen and being able to then see someone standing in front of it, perfectly lit, um, that there was a real contrast issue. There was yeah. a real, you know, and that 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 a video wall that high, that high, it was a six millimeter wall, so it was very, very crisp and very bright. And so we brought it down to probably half of its possible output, sure. and it still looked gorgeous. And then you could actually see people on stage without me having to overlight them, right? Because the, what happened at a certain point was, uh, uh, you know, the presenter would come up on stage and say, "Jesus Christ, I'm too, I, I'm, I'm way too bright up here. I feel very bright." To which I'd say, "You look great out in the audience." Right. right? But it was all about that contrast. Yeah, and and you know, this this comes to me from a sustainability point of view. You don't want to get into an arms race. Right. You don't want to get no, into this right. arms race where, like, the screens got brighter, so the lights have to get right. brighter, which means the screens need to get bright. You know, you can ratchet that up to right. no, you know, ad, ad nauseum. Right. That's not effective for anybody. You know. No, and certainly it, not. It goes back to what you were talking about about selective brightness, though, and selective and relative brightness. Not everything needs to be a ten. If everything's a ten, nothing is right. Like that. It just goes to mud. It just goes to mud. Right. right. Um, speaking on uh, a sort of to the AV crowd, um, what are some of the biggest integration issues that you see out in the field? What are some of the things that you wish, you know, either a manufacturer would come up with to solve or just as a design principle or a sort of production principle that you wish that you'd see more going out in the field? I mean, I have some of my own bugaboos, but I'm curious to hear yours. Um, I think my my biggest gripes actually are in the permanent uh, install. Sure. Uh, going back to residential. Um, the amount of different ways that lights can be controlled uh, for manufacturers now, uh, because of how LED, you know, in the inherent uh, changes in, in LED. Whether it's that you know most manufacturers now are offering zero to ten control um, without there being an additional charge, right? That's the cost of the fixture, and it can be controlled at zero to ten. Well, that's awesome and actually a fantastic way to do it. But what we're finding is that there's a lot of cost. On the integrator side, right, um, as opposed to being able to do a leading or a trailing edge dimmer uh, that are relative, you know, that that most integrators uh, have at a much better cost cost point. Um, so th- I think that's my biggest my biggest hit right now with with LEDs and lighting, and and I, and I pride myself on most of my architectural specs, if not all, uh, at this point are LED. Are LED. Um, right. There we have. We have hit a point with RGB and white LED that it can be done gorgeously. Uh, they can be controlled very, very well. Uh, there's no longer an excuse not to do it, really. Um, but I think where I find myself hitting my head a little bit is on the is on the control side. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, um, and especially when you start to get into energy management conversations. Yeah. What it's not a matter of what is possible anymore. We can set up the system to do more or less anything, but when you start to get too cute with these systems, that you know there's a daylight sensor that's going to drop the lights to this level unless it's occupied at this time between the, you know right. 
it becomes right. way, way, you know, you yeah. get so many, um, sometimes, I mean, this is a, a very quick story, but I, I just experienced this yesterday. I was at a, uh, I'm not going to name the organization because I don't want to, you know, I don't want to do that to them, but I was at an organization's event on energy saving lighting and, and some of the methods and methodologies to save light, and it was an eight hour, you know, seminar thing that was broken up into portions, and that's fine. Um, it was at a space, and I will just say that the owners of this space had both the money and the means to install photo cells and occupancy sensors and all those things. None of it was actually there. So you're in a conference room talking about daylight harvesting. You walk outside, there's a huge skylight, and all the track lights are on for no apparent reason. But that, that aside, for a second, <laughs> in the conference room, there are four old school, um, I think they're high-end studio spot, 250-watt little moving heads. Why wow. the conference room had them, I don't know. Okay. But as part of the turning the lights on in the morning, the moving lights turned on. They weren't illuminating anything, <laughs> but all the lamps struck at 250 watts apiece. Sure, sure, sure. And so we're in a conference room talking about how to save lighting with smarter controls oh. while four moving lights are burning their lamps, right. not illuminating anything. And it just made me think, we need to start at the simplest step. You know, what are the first principles about what how a space needs to be controlled? Right. And then once we've mastered that, maybe we can get into sort of talking about conditional programming and some of the things that we, you know, the whiz-bang things we talk about. But all of this happens at a, a specifier level. Yeah. When it filters down to the end user, it's... You know, it's very difficult to translate those lessons in a lot of cases, especially if ownership changes or management changes or any of those sure. things, which is just natural to the evolution of the building. Yeah. Um, do you see uh, some companies, some larger companies, are, are launching this idea of lighting as service? You know, they're they're talking about continual upgrades to to spaces and to to building plants. What, do you see the lighting designer and 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 by extension? Uh, AV folks and anybody else in this industry, do you see that as the as the trend where you, you're going back to a client and sort of revamping their schemes, or do you, you know, it feels like there used to be a time when it was like you get the drawings done, you get it finished, and it's over. Now it feels like because the LED is evolving, we keep kind of going back and sort of talking about new ways to either control it or upgrade it. Or what, what's your take on that? I think you're right. I think um, what used to what used to just go into the hands of, let's say, the building engineers or or an end you know end an end user uh, in residential, um, I think uh, lighting is so uh, in the forefront of discussion now. You walk into a big box uh, store like Home Depot or Lowe's, and the amount of LEDs on the on the shelf. If anyone has even a moment of thought, they're going to come back to their their you know, preferred designer and say, hey, I saw all these things, right? Like, is any of this something that, that we should be utilizing? Like, if they have the littlest bit of, of interest, uh, they're going to see that it's it's in the news, it's it's on the shelves. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I have, I have two or three clients that, um, although the project may have, quote, unquote, finished, you know, five or six years ago, um, the technology that was available then is different than it is now. So that, you know, subtle things like being able to go back and replace um, xenon strips that otherwise were not really available in that nice a color temperature with that great a dimming uh, in an LED replacement five or six years ago. I'm now going back in. Instead, you know, when something goes, when a transformer goes or some lamps go, it is a, it's, a, it's an excuse now for my client to say, hey, is there a new solution? Yeah, I think that's that's dead on, um, and I think it's interesting because we're all getting asked that. I mean, I, I know because I get these phone calls every day. Contractors are getting asked these questions. You know, EV people are being asked these questions. Really, anybody that works in the sort of electronic side of a home sure. or on the you know, like a retail space where they're talking to a facilities manager, the facilities manager turns to them and says, "Can't we do this with LED?" You right. Know? Right. And that's another thing that I think. We should talk about a little bit is product is is um, what's the best way to say this uh, quality control and quality checks on new products. Yeah. Um, one of the, the roles I think of uh, lighting designers in the industry is to sort of cull the, the crap, you know, for lack of a better term. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and what, do you how much how much product do you see in a week or a month? Do you do you, do you try to you know cull out some of the, the stuff that's that's coming your way? 
I'm constantly if I if I'm not getting a sample from a client or from a from a vendor, I'm buying stuff you know directly from the internet and right. and, and auditioning it. Right. Uh, that's our job. That's absolutely our job. Um, I'll be at Light Fair next week, uh, you know, and that's part of it too. I bought myself the the best meter on the market right now that gives me color temperature, uh, color rendering index, uh, oh, wow. right. All specifically built for LEDs, um, which has been a, a, a real plus, right? It allows me to sort of, you know, call out the. I think the biggest issue I found is manufacturers' claim on CRI, mm -hmm. right? The color rendering index, which is ultimately important for uh, a residential space specifically, and then retail most definitely. Um, the, a lot of the corporate lobbies I do, it's not as it's not as big of a deal. It's a transient space. Um, it doesn't have quite the impact, but a retail space and a, a someone's home, uh, CRI is of utmost importance. Sure. Um, and if the product says that it's 80 plus, I want to know that it's 80 plus and not 63 or 72, yeah. you know, which makes a big difference. Um, and so I've I've made it a point to arm myself with tools to 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 test them and just and to call out call you know call out manufacturers and say hey, your product's not not doing what it said it would do. Right, right. And do you, um, for those, for, for folks that are, you know, this is maybe not totally familiar with, with lighting in general, so CRI is color rendering index and the, the 0 to 100 relative scale that, that was created, 100 being perfect, um, or, 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 as close to perfect as possible. Right. Um, generally, light sources don't fall below the 70s, you know, but we do see that 80 is sort of a, a basic benchmark. Yeah. And, 90 plus for CRI or in LEDs is what we look for when yeah. we're specifying these things. The importance of it, the reason that we, we look for that is, you know, if it's a 90 plus CRI, hopefully things in the colors like reds and blues and greens pop to your eye and then mixed colors, like if you're looking at a sweater that's a beige color, it renders properly. You don't take it outside in the sunlight and see a totally different color. That's that's the, the goal. That's it right. makes things more vivid and real. Um, and it's an important metric that is not talked about very often when you're dealing with even like an office space or something like that. Right. And I think that it, it is an important metric even in a space like that because you're spending eight to ten hours a day. Agreed. In it. Agreed. Um, so when you're uh, when you're walking a client through a spec um, and and you've got the the production team there or uh, you know in the case of a permanent install your electricians your engineers whoever might be at the table. Um, do you talk about, uh, when you're talking about what gear you're specifying, do you go through those sorts of metrics, or do, do you, is it get down to how does this work, what is it going to look like? I mean, I guess what I'm asking is, how do you relate design to your clients? Uh, it depends on the client. You know, I think uh, in the case of an architect that I have a relationship with, um, you know, we have an agreed upon aesthetic. Uh, so I think early in that relationship, I would go through those things in significant detail, make sure that they understood that I'm thinking about those things on a daily basis, and that's part of what they've hired me to do. Um, I think on a, a live production, certainly, I'm going to talk. You know, I'm going to talk the producer uh, through uh, what the different, uh, you know, what the different scenes are going to look like. What you know, we're going to play them on, and we're going to have a ballyhoo that looks like this, and the. We're going to settle the lights, and there'll be you know blue lights for the video, and you know, and there's this sort of more general discussion. Um, but I think, you know, I, I think to your point about CRI, I think to your point about um, any of those metrics, those are things that I find that certainly earlier in a relationship, I'll talk about more, okay. uh, and that becomes a learning point between you know that's something that I find that I that I can. Pass along as as information. That's part of my job again as the designer is to is to explain what these metrics are and that they are important, um, different than just picking the right size recessed downlight off the right. shelf at, at Home Depot. Right. This right. is what differentiates us as lighting designers. Right. And and so um, in that design discussion, I'm I'm just curious how how much do you rely on renderings and uh, on that sort of tool set? It's not one that i am ever been particularly crazy about um, for lighting specifically. I just feel like you're setting up false expectations sometimes. Well, it's interesting. So I used to say that uh, a lot, uh, particularly when I was doing strictly theater. Mm -hmm. um, now, when I'm presenting uh, 
like a live event for a corporate uh, for a corporate client. I've I've become I've relied come to rely on renderings pretty heavily, um, mm. and found that and I'll make a plug right now. I found that with with Vectorworks and their RenderWorks package um, and their Spotlight package, which is basically a theatrical lighting tool that allows me to to render using tools that I use every day, as opposed to some odd lighting tool that's in a rendering package. It's actually a Leco or a moving light with colors that I'm familiar with uh, hung at the end, you know, hung in the space where I want it hung, and right. it, it is an it is a pretty amazing uh, true representation of what I'm able what I'm able to give them. Um, so more and more, I'm finding that that I'm able to offer that, uh, and that it and that it has become a decent tool. Yeah, I think previs for special events and for that that had, it's almost essential these days. Yeah. I mean, producers need to see it. They they you really can't get away with um, you know just saying no. Trust me, it'll, it's going to look good. Right. <laughs> you can't really like that's. Well, like they're spending a, a ton of money, right? They're spending a ton of money. They want some assurance. My fear is not so much in those events as, or those kinds of projects as much as it is for architectural installations. That worries me a little bit only because you're not necessarily in like a Vectorworks world where, you know, a, 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 a source 4 is a source 4 is a source 4, right? Like we know how that's going to render. In I tell you, it's more and more, I mean, I just, I've been doing it now a little bit. Vectorworks now accepts IES files. Okay. And with more and more companies having their IES file available, mm -hmm. again, it's be it is becoming very, very real. Uh, and I've actually used it as a point of comparison. Uh, if I use these downlights in this hallway as opposed to these downlights in this hallway, uh, I've, I've actually found myself making a choice based on, based on some very, very basic renderings. Sure. Um, that you can get a real sense of, of the you know the difference that they'll make on the space. Yeah, you're the first designer I've talked to that's using RenderWorks and Vectorworks for architectural applications. I've heard of, it's a standard for sure, 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 sure. Yeah, that's, well, I've, yeah, I'm, I, I'll admit I've been a little stubborn. I, I you know, the the majority of the architectural world uses AutoCAD, right? right? Um, I'm able to take in an AutoCAD file, manipulate it, and spit it back out for the architect at no problem. But in my manipulation, I'm using Vectorworks and I'm using RenderWorks, and I'm able to bring in these IES files. Um, it's just something I've been I've been using Vectorworks since it's since it probably for 15 or 20 years. It's just something that I've followed, and it's become a a real asset for me. Uh, sure. To take the time to learn AutoCAD at this point would be a real step backwards as far as productivity. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, every, every, tool sets are a whole like that. We could do a whole podcast on tool sets, sure. and like you know, that's a whole. I, I I love that stuff, and just getting into how people work, and and you know what tools they, they like to bring to the table. Um, but no, I think it's interesting because, especially when you're talking about controls and queuing a show, sure, you really can plan through in a render yeah. package yeah. how it's going to work from moment to moment to moment, and it's. It, they're saving. You, you said it. They're spending a ton of money, but you can also save a ton of money in tech by not. Oh, I've done money. absolutely. We've done. I mean, for this, for the NBC upfront, we did a day of previs uh, offsite, but then we also brought um, a previs package onsite that allowed us to queue even though the light the lights weren't up in the air yet. Right. right? We right. had the console set up in the back of the room, and we were we were prevising in a in a Grand MA 3D. Um, right. And then as soon as the lights actually turned on, we got to see live what we were doing on the screen moments earlier. Right, right. And so you're, you're doing little focus notes, you're doing little, you know, little pan and tilt notes, but it's yeah. not, you know, you're not programming from scratch, which that's is right. just, that's the way that, that's the way it ought to work. Yeah, <laughs> no, it, and, it, and it works amazingly well. Yeah, and that's, we can, we, we'll have you back on to talk about how that okay. process works and, and sort of walk through that in more detail. But, sure. Um, but we're getting we're, we're a little past 1:30, and so I wanted to give you a chance to to sort of if there's something that you can uh, impart or something that you want to sort of sum up in what what you think uh, the lighting designer's role is and and how you want to work together, you know, the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I mean, I think we've we've covered a lot. I think you know the key is bring us in early, uh, let us collaborate on more than you think we necessarily know, uh, <laughs> um, and uh, you know, I think 
the more that the more we can come up with uh, let me speak architecturally the more we can come up with what the 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 details are together uh, as opposed to trying to cram lights into a cove you've already figured out architecturally yeah. I think the better uh, you know we're here lighting designers are here to support the design community whether it be live events or uh, permanent uh, permanent projects we're in support and the earlier you bring us in the more supportive we can be I think that's my my uh, imparting and I think that's a that's a good place to, to, to drop it off there Christian thank you so much for joining us um, for everyone that's watching and everyone that's gonna listen and watch in the future it's d1ny.com is the link to Christian's site. That's where you can find his work and, and you know, retain him and do projects with him and, you know, <laughs> and all the things that, that, you know, keep the <laughs> keep the world going around and, right on. you know, renew your Vectorworks license. Right. Um, and I am James Bedell of the Lighting Guy podcast here at AV Nation, and I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be here. You can find, you can send questions to me at at James Bedell, J-A-M-E-S-B-E-D-E-L-L, -E -E -L -L, down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to George to, to talk about AV Nation. Thanks, guys. And this is a real quick, this has been The Lighting Guy, a production of AV Nation. That's avnation.tv where you'll find this and many more pro AV, audiovisual, and lighting shows. That's avnation.tv with The Lighting Guy with James Bedell and others. Thank you for watching. This has been The Lighting Guy. Thank <laughs> you.